You're listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hello, fellow human. Welcome back to the Higher Ideas Podcast. Now, last episode, I told you about a video that would be coming out uh, within a week about uh, my book, and I told you to keep an eye out on the website and YouTube to catch that when it comes out. And now it's been about two weeks, the video hasn't come out, and I thought I'd just explain. You see, I haven't ever been a person who appears on camera, so you can imagine that brings up a whole list of challenges that aren't making this as straightforward a process as I hoped it would be. Um, In fact, it's pretty similar to when I started this very podcast. Uh, I wasn't comfortable back then with even my voice being recorded, and that was a whole learning curve. So I find myself repeating that all over again with visually appearing on camera while speaking. It's like adding another ball to the mental juggling act of uh, speaking on any sort of recording. Um, especially when it's visual, you have to minimize editing, so you have to, as much as possible, get it in one take, and not only get the words right, but not make any weird faces, or have to pause and swallow. I mean, it's it's a lot more challenging to appear on video than audio, and I've got audio pretty down pat, I think, but video is a whole new beast, so bear with me while I uh, get my camera legs, as it were. But it's coming. That video, I'm not going to promise any more timelines, but I would guess another week it'll be out. But in the meantime, hey, why waste time? I can make another episode of the audio podcast for you guys. So, today I think we're going to talk about psychedelics some more. I kind of teased last time a general view of psychedelics. And why not go into some personal experiences to give you an idea, if you had never heard about psychedelics before, to give you an idea of what a journey might be like through a psychedelic experience. And if you are experienced, uh, what I have found in myself and others is that psychedelic adventurers love hearing other people's journeys. So um, this is what this episode will be, a bit of a sampling of my adventures in psychedelia. But first, we have to do today's Dissecting Ego, which I forgot last time. So here we go, today's Dissecting Ego. So, what piece of ego are we exploring today? Well, I would like to look at an aspect of ego that just adds to its uh, slipperiness. Ego, when you start wrestling with it, you realize it's like a greased-up anaconda. It's really hard to get a grip on. It tends to escape. It's very tricky. It likes to throw up distractions, and uh, it really is uh, a very, very wily opponent to try to wrangle. And one of these aspects, one of these very slippery aspects of ego, is that when people hear ego, that they have uh, ego issues to deal with, or someone accuses them of having ego issues, by and large, I think people tend to imagine the term egotistical. And someone might say, I'm not egotistical at all. I don't think, actually, I think very low of myself, so I don't have an ego problem. Don't tell me that. Well, you see, there, right there, is the slippery ego at work. Because the fact is, ego cuts in many ways. It cuts different people in many ways. Some people, yeah, it makes them have an inflated sense of importance, uh, or a sense of superiority. That is probably the most classic and visible way that ego uh, traps somebody. But that example I just gave of someone saying, you know, I I feel very lowly and small, Uh, I don't have an ego issue. Well, that is an ego issue. That is another way ego can affect someone. You see, ego can turn around the other way and make someone feel smaller than they are and keep someone trapped in a state of disability, in a state of uh, diminishing themselves and their own potential. And the way it does that is, of course, through fear. 
through fear or latching on to negative things that have happened in the past or negative projections that other people have put onto them that this person has adopted. See, when it comes down to it, ego, your ego, my ego, anybody's ego, is nothing but a story. If you were to describe a character in a play and make a bullet point list of that character's qualities, all of those qualities are ego. It is that particular character's storyline, that particular character's behavior patterns, that particular character's um, leanings, you could say. This is what ego does. Ego keeps track of your story versus everyone else's story to try and figure out a way to fit in. Now, it could be possible that your particular story is a weakening one instead of a, a falsely strengthening one. One that tells you you're worthless, you'll never amount to anything, uh, you fail at everything you try. Anything that is a story ascribed to yourself is part of your ego. So you have to realize that, yes, even that is something you can overcome. Anything that is keeping you from being your inner true self is ego. The cage of ideas about yourself that is wrapped around your soul. And your soul is what you really are. So you might have a person that feels they have great potential. Or they're, uh, they're just waiting to burst out of themselves and be who they really are for the first time in their life. But they feel, I'm weak, I fail at everything, all the stuff I said earlier, and all sorts of different angles that prevent that potential from, from happening. That's like a shell wrapped around your soul that is meant, the ego is meant to protect your inner self from outside forces. But, of course, as we've discussed in the past, when this thing gets too thick, when this thing builds up without a sense of um, attention put onto it, when it just is allowed to collect ideas by itself and start to build the shell thicker and thicker, you end up with a person that's trapped within it, within its story, which is very powerful because... How do we exist in this world without keeping track of ourselves and others, our past, who we are? I mean, yes, that's important. But what is also important is dividing which part of that story is truly you and which part is ego. And most of the time you will find that those things about yourself that you feel negatively about, those things about yourself, let's, say, let's not say negatively because ego can make you feel negatively about who you really are as in the case of, say, a homosexual that's very ashamed of themselves. Let's say mostly things um, that prevent you from being free, things that prevent you from living with ease, let's say that, living without a sense of effort, without a sense of subterfuge, without a sense of fear. All of those aspects that prevent that from happening are your ego. You could be pretty damn sure. And once you make that division between what you really are and which parts of who you think you are is actually ego, then you get to take charge. Because no matter how scary ego can be, no matter how powerfully um, influential it can be for a person through fear, you can always, always override it. Because in every second of life, you are making choices. Your ego is not intelligent. Your ego is a system that's a part of your intelligence, and you can decide in any moment I'm stepping over this. I am taking overriding control on this life in this very second and deciding. Now, as I said last episode, psychedelics are very helpful in providing such an opening. But it can be done also with just deep self-work, uh, with paying attention to one's behaviors and leanings. So this may be a very vague piece of dissecting ego, but that's because it's a very slippery aspect of ego. And the more you get into it, the more it becomes difficult to clearly define. But I just wanted to point this out. I see a lot of people out there with, uh, I guess, what you could call insecurity complexes, or I guess you could call them self-minimizing storylines, and you hear them make comments about themselves, diminishing comments about themselves, that just stop. It's just, um, well, I would do that, but, you know, I'm a coward. Or I would do that, but I always fail. I would, but terminus. 
just ends. The whole concept just stops. That is running into a brick wall without even trying. And it's always ego. So that's it. Awareness is always the first step in the battle against ego, especially awareness of ego's own tricks. So here's another trick for you. Uh, don't assume that because you're not uh, an ego bag, so to speak, that you don't have ego running the show. Uh, it is so much more tricky. In the way I just described and so many others, ego cuts in many angles. It is a many-tentacled beast that affects everyone differently, but the similarity in the effects is always that the person ends up trapped in a cage of stories and lies. And that's uh, the first most important thing to realize in the battle against it. And even calling it a battle is an ego sort of perspective. You can never win. You can never defeat ego without leaving your body, because it's a part of this whole existing thing. Keeping track of your story, knowing who you are in relation to the rest of the objects in this universe is the purpose of ego, and as long as you're alive, you need that. But uh, when I say battle, of course, I mean the battle for managing it, for living with ego, uh, taming it, owning it, keeping an eye on it, and making sure you know uh, when you're being you versus when you're being your ego. <laughs> so let's get to today's topic, as I said, which will be uh, Tales of Psychedelia. <laughs> So as I admitted last episode, I've been uh, in a relationship with psychedelics for several years at this point. And uh, at this point in my life, it's maybe a couple of experiences a year, nothing too much more than that. But in the beginning, you know, I had a couple of months of quite frequent uh, visits to psychedelic space. I guess you could compare it to a relationship and sex. It begins with sex all the time, every day at the drop of a hat, and then eventually evens out to once in a while, right? That's how it was for me with psychedelics. I started off with a bunch of weeks of frequent use and have petered it down to about a couple times a year. But that very first experience, uh, which was very short and simple, actually kind of set the tone for all of my future experiences. I was curious about psychedelics for the reasons I described last episode, so I got myself some magic mushrooms, quote-unquote, and decided to figure out a good dose for myself through experience. So, of course, I started with a very low dose because I didn't know how this would affect me. My first ever experience with marijuana when I was a teenager was miserable, and I have never heard a story like it, and uh, that actually kept me off of marijuana for a whole bunch of years after that. So I thought, if this is going to happen with mushrooms, I better start slow. So I did. I took one gram of these dried mushrooms, uh, which is not even really supposed to be an active dose. Uh, it's a very vague dose to take. I think for most people, noticeable effects start around two grams, uh, definitely around three, and more and more as you up the dosage, uh, five being quite a potent uh, trip. And then, you know, you can just keep adding as, as adventurous as you become. But I did. I took this one gram, maybe just to see if I would die, if I would get poisoned. I think that's a pretty common fear with people. What if I have an allergic reaction or something? So I took one gram, and I waited. I knew it would take about an hour for things to start happening, so I was browsing the internet. And I would say maybe 45 minutes later, which is usually how long it takes for me, I started feeling anxious. I started feeling a jitteriness in, in my stomach, in my bones, a sort of anxiety that was building up. And I thought, well, maybe this is something starting to happen. Let me turn off the computer, lay in my bed, and just give it a chance. Just relax and open up and give it a chance to do its subtle thing that it's going to do. So after laying down for maybe... 10 minutes with um, some soft music playing just to sort of color the background and dim lighting comfortably in my bed. 
I started, for some reason, feeling that I was sinking into my mattress, physically tunneling down through my mattress with my whole body. And that's a feeling that, you know, comes frequently when you're relaxed, but this was pretty clear. This was, it felt physically almost real that I was sinking. And I decided to go with it and just see where this is going to head. Maybe this is the experience starting. So I sank and I sank and I sank through my mattress, through the floor, deeper and deeper and deeper. And I had my eyes closed, but I definitely had a real sense that I was now in a tunnel in the shape of my body, and I could almost see uh, the exit of the tunnel up above where my mattress was, getting far out of view, and I was feeling this dark uh, tunneling sensation building around me that I was sort of trapped in this long, long tunnel in the shape of me. Um, so when it started getting kind of scary, kind of cold feeling, I thought maybe this could twist into something negative, Better try and take control and see if I could change this. So I sort of willed to myself, okay, let's stop sinking, let's rise now, let's go back up. And so it did. Uh, the sinking sensation stopped way down deep in this body tunnel I had carved and turned around and started heading back towards the surface where my bed was. And so up and up I drifted slowly until I finally arrived back where I started laying on my mattress on the top of my bed. And that was kind of interesting. I still had my eyes closed, and I was still letting things go where they wanted to go. I was still not sure if I was just imagining things or fooling myself into thinking I was hallucinating. It was very, very vague still. But what happened next, as tends to happen with psychedelics, is the story of, of these feelings I was having started driving itself. So what happened next, once I arrived back at my uh, original location, the rising sensation that had brought me back up didn't stop. I could feel now a sort of reverse gravity, a sort of pulling on all of the upper part of my body, so my chest, the top of my arms, top of my legs, all the way down to my feet, and on the front of my face. There was this sort of suction, this sort of up feeling like a giant magnet was trying to lift me off the mattress and all my flesh was starting to pull upwards, which is a very peculiar feeling. And I thought, that's weird. It feels like something's fighting gravity here, but I'm stuck. I'm stuck in this very tense position. And then for whatever reason, I just had this mental idea of a sort of a zipper, something like a, an organic zipper all the way down the center of my body, down the center of my legs and arms and face, in my mind's eye, of course. And then I saw the seam open, and inside the seam was like a bunch of intercrossed fingers. If you take your two hands and cross your fingers together, lock them together, and you look, there's a sort of zigzag shape that's formed. Now, if you can imagine this zigzag shape started to tear apart and the fingers became exposed, these strange fleshy... Uh, tentacle-like things all released each other and opened. So it was kind of like a sea anemone opening, something very organic. My body was opening this way. Behind my, my flesh, there was my bones. They also opened this way. Everything of my physical body opened up and bloomed open like some kind of of kind of creepy, fleshy flower, but at the same time, it was almost a beautiful thing to envision. It was like a natural opening, a beautiful blooming. And out of this blooming, in the center of my body, was revealed this blue, glowing, electric, sort of skeleton uh, of electricity. I guess you could say it was like... Uh, an electrical representation of my nervous system. It was like um, a ghostly, electric, glowing, very delicate um, pattern of, of flowing energy. And at the brain, around my head, there was a big mass of this energy. So very quickly I realized, wow, this really seems to be a representation of my entire conscious nervous system. Not the physical nervous system, but the electricity running through it. And there it is, a mast at my brain, and I think also around my heart there was quite a collection of this energy. 
And I just sort of uh, was witnessing this, realizing, whoa, this uh, looks like, you could say, my soul. Now, I had never really thought about the soul too much before this point, and this is definitely where it, it sort of came into my awareness, this concept of the human soul. And as soon as I recognized this thing, it started rising, because my body had opened, and it started free from my body, started floating upwards. And as that happened, I realized that that's what was trying to keep rising, and it was being held behind by my body. And not only that, but now that it was rising free from my body, I realized that my actual consciousness, uh, my position in space, uh, was rising with it. I was that thing rising out of my body as I also watched it rise. It was quite a strange uh, uh, thing to try and describe, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. When this thing started moving up, I started moving up, and I realized, oh, that's me. That is the meanest that is me, that body that is now still on the mattress. That thing isn't me, it is mine, as I and this electric ghost float upwards. And I am now floating up out of my body. And as I did, I soon arrived at my ceiling, I passed through my ceiling. I went through the main floor of our home, and passed through the ceiling of the living room. And then I went through my parents' bedroom and passed through their ceiling, through the attic, out the roof, up into the sky, over my neighborhood. And as I arrived, I guess where the clouds would start happening, uh, the earth faded from memory, and I sort of transitioned into this nondescript space, this infinitely huge orange and pink pastel-y colored cloudy universe um it felt like liquid it felt like i was floating up always still the feeling of floating up was happening but now i was floating up in a sort of liquid universe of far far distant um, clouds as i described of purple uh, orange and pink very soft glowing color far 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 away in a massive sphere so i don't know if this place had a wall far far away or if i was just seeing the haze of distance all around me but it certainly seemed that there was nothing near me i was in this huge empty universe of 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 insulating uh syrup-like, very sort of liquidy feeling uh, dimension with this far, far away glowing limit all the way around me, up, down, all around. It was like my own little universe. And so I accepted that. I had actually forgotten who I was already. I had forgotten my body. I had forgotten that I had taken mushrooms. In that moment, I was just at peace. I was just a free-floating consciousness in my own private orange universe, and I had not a care in the world as I floated up and up and up, and that's what was happening, and that's all that there ever was, uh, and it was comforting, it was beautiful, it was peaceful, it was relaxing for God's sake, uh, I think I needed that at that point, and as I floated up for a while, I don't even know how long, you lose track of time in a very deep mushroom experience. I eventually was jarred out of my sense of peace and acceptance when I suddenly hit what felt like a ceiling. Not in a violent way, but just like a balloon kind of bouncing off the ceiling when it gets there. It was just a sort of boom, just a sort of bounce back down a little bit and stop rising. So I hit some kind of limit. And of course, all of these visuals I'm describing are happening with my eyes closed like a dream. So... Uh, that's why they're described as visions, right? Uh, so bear that in mind. As I describe that, there was no ceiling that I can see, quote-unquote. I couldn't see any limits. There was no reason for me to have stopped, except that I seemed to have encountered a wall of some sort. And after being jarred by this for a moment, and kind of disappointed that my infinite flight was now changed... Well, I quickly accepted, okay, so that's what we're doing now. We're staying still. No problem. I'm going to stay still in the center of this beautiful liquid universe and just stay here forever with uh, sort of my nose up against this mysterious force field that I've encountered. 
and I wasn't giving it much thought beyond that, until very quickly after I stopped rising and encountered this wall, I started to feel up above, on the other side of this sort of force field, that there was some feeling of presence quickly starting to form, some disturbance, some feeling of not being alone anymore, now my universe was uh, being intruded by something, it was quite a disappointing feeling. It was, it was a sort of, uh, now fear had to come into the picture a little bit as I asked myself, what's happening here? Who is this other person? Why am I not alone? What do they want? All of these annoying inner chatters that happen from our interaction with others showed up in my beautiful little universe as I felt a presence starting to form above me. And as it formed seemingly out of the stuff that this universe was made of, and as it started to gather and gather, it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it became a massive thing floating above me. And I'm saying I felt like an ant beneath this giant, almost, um, well, look, as small as an ant would feel next to your face. That's how I felt next to this thing that was now forming quite solidly above me and quite now noticeably conscious. I don't know how to describe that I knew that, but there's just a sense you have when you're in the presence of another that I had in the presence of this thing. And the other in this case was very huge and powerful and alien and strange. And as it finally finished forming, I realized it was something like a massive face leaning down over me and I couldn't really tell you know it didn't have any concrete uh, features it was just definitely some vague um, uh, smooth kind of looking face thing almost made out of jellyfish flesh it was translucent it had no mouth no teeth no nostrils no eyeballs but it had the outlines of a face it had the feeling of a face looking at me. So here I am confronted with this massive face erupted out of the flesh of this dimension, leaning down over me very intimately, very close, just like as if you had a, an ant in your hand and stuck your eyes right up to it to look at it. That's how I felt being observed by this thing. And of course, the first thing that crossed my mind was, what is this thing? What are you? I sort of directed that thought at that thing because it was the only way to speak, really. I couldn't just use my mouth. I didn't have a mouth anymore. So I just used my mind to ask, what are you? And instantly, in my mind, an answer arrived in the voice of a man and a woman speaking on top of each other at the same time. The man saying, father, and the woman saying, mother, mother, father, very um, gently spoken in a very sort of soothing way, mother, father came to my mind. And just in that simple, that simple answer, I immediately had to start thinking, holy crap, that could only mean really God. An energy, a conscious energy has formed above me, calling itself the father and the mother, the creator. Wow. So, what do you say to something like that? <laughs> what do you say after learning that you're possibly, at least in this dream, quote-unquote, being confronted by this thing that calls itself your mother and your father? And it gets crazier than that for me, because I also realized, uh, this is a whole other story that I'll touch on later, I had had a dream many, many years before that, a very mysterious moment of my life, in which in a dream the voices of a man and a woman were debating my life, um, and I could overhear them talking about me. And this was the first and only real lucid dream I've ever had, because I was lucid in this dream, hearing this conversation. And it turns out, at the end of the dream, that these two voices knew that I was listening to them, even though they were pretending they didn't. And at the end of the dream, the male voice had confronted me directly, telling me that when I wake up, I would know that this was not a dream, and that there were really a man and woman speaking to me, and that I had to listen to their message. And when I woke up immediately afterwards, a piece of the dream was on my chest, on my blanket, sitting there. Yeah, 
So I had had quite a crazy experience when I was younger, out of many others. And here, hearing this mother-father, I realized that these were the voices that were in that dream many, many years ago before I touched any sort of drug. This strange, miraculous moment I had experienced in my life. And here is the same force now confronting me in the psychedelic experience. So that was quite a reunion. Immediately I had a feeling of, oh my god, I remember this place. And holy moly, I remember you. And all of a sudden I had a feeling of homecoming, of it has been so long. I have been so lost. I, I just... It was a sort of a feeling of collapsing at the doorstep, finally arriving home from a massive journey, and just I fell completely limp into the embrace of this strange, giant being above me. Just a sort of, a wretched sort of, oh, just help me, I'm, I'm a wreck. Just a sort of a, a surrender into this force that was confronting me. And I guess what I'm saying is I stopped questioning at that moment and just allowed myself to be in the presence of this thing. And there was a short sort of emotional back and forth about all of this. Oh, it's been so long. I recognize you. I've been so lost. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, all of this catharsis, all of this junk came out of me and was embraced and was understood by this force. And... Uh, once all of that reactionary stuff played out, and I was once again at neutral, there was all of a sudden in my mind the strangest idea. Now, in psychedelics, um, just like in dreams, sometimes whatever force is behind this, be it your mind, or be it maybe God, as I've described, maybe an external consciousness is at work here. I mean, you could even say it's your subconscious. Whatever is going on in psychedelics, it definitely seems that when um, these forces want to speak to you or communicate something, it will always have to use what is already in your mind. So ideas you've had, experiences you've had, the most random thought might come up. Um, and the way it makes you feel or the symbol that it holds for you is exactly what the force is trying to tell you. So let me give you the example here, because this sounds strange, but immediately um, after this neutrality came back to my, to my being, I was presented with this strange idea that I was a bus, and I was being pulled into a bus terminal, a sort of a maintenance bay for buses. And I thought, why am I thinking about buses, and why am I thinking about all of a sudden a concrete maintenance bay with tools and everything. But the message in that was maintenance is coming. Because right after that moment, um, something came at me out of this face. It was a strange tube, like a, like a living organic tube, came out of this thing's forehead, I think, came down like a snake, and came through that force field that I couldn't penetrate, but it came right through it at me. And then it went into my mouth. And instead of being alarmed, I sort of had this weird understanding that, yeah, this is what happens, and I accepted it. And it sort of plugged into me, like a sort of a big, I don't know, a big vent of some sort, some kind of big uh, uh, just delivery tube for something plugged into me. And it was alive, it was sort of... Um, uh, gyrating like an intestinal wall might, you know, just pumping. And then I could see it start to really pump in and out, in and out, as this something came down the pipe and entered my mouth. And when this stuff hit me, I realized that this was life energy, because as it shot right into my belly, it went all the way to the ends of my toes. I mean, now I was starting to remember my body, because I was feeling down on my mattress, my body being jolted, by this amazing rush of life, of, of health, of living, of power, of invigoration, all the way down to the tips of my toes and the ends of my fingers as I was watching in the vision this tube pump and pump and pump, and I almost thought I would explode. I thought my fingertips and my toes would burst from the power with which this life energy was being pumped into me. And before very long, uh, the pumping slowed down, and the thing disconnected. And 
retreated back into this mysterious ghost face thing above me. And, you know, when this kind of stuff is happening to you, and especially in your first psychedelic experience, you just kind of just try to keep up with what's happening. You never really know what's going to happen. You just try to digest it as it's coming. You just try to sort of handle it as you're experiencing it. But definitely, as exotic as this experience was, it definitely felt healing, and it felt good. It felt, it felt um, right. It felt natural. And so I let it keep going, and I didn't fight it as all the stuff started happening to me. The next thing that happened was that I felt down around the tips of my toes and my feet and my legs this wave of something starting to wash over me from foot to head. Um, and it felt like hundreds of little hands, little uh, tickly, um, grabby, little feely, like feelers, starting to wash over me. And as they went up my legs, over my hips, up my torso, it seemed that anywhere I had tension, these little hands would mass, would amass and hold on and grab onto the tension and pluck it off of me. It was almost like a bunch of little workers um, sweeping over my entire body, checking for problems. And any time they found a problem, they would really group up around it until they could wrestle it off of me. And as this was happening, I was thinking, holy moly, is this it? Is this the healing that everyone talks about with psychedelics? I didn't know it was this literal. This is literally a bunch of little feelers crawling over me and e extracting problems. So I was letting this happen. And it did wash over my entire body until it got to my head. And got to my forehead specifically, where I had been carrying a heavy load for quite a while at that point, uh, back in the real world. I had had a really heavy headache on my forehead that just made me feel like I had a boulder strapped to my face that was just pulling me down. And this was, I didn't know what it was. Was it illness? Was it stress? There was no telling, but th the only thing that was clear was that my life was definitely being hindered by this weight in my head. And when these little hands got to my head, my forehead, uh, they of course caught on to this big chunk of something that was going on there, and all of them rushed in. And in an overwhelming way, I mean, just I couldn't really fight it, um, they started pulling this thing off of my forehead, and I could feel it lifting, I could feel the burden lifting. But something really strange happened just then. Um, in the same way that you feel that coldness, uh, you know when you cut your nails and you haven't cut your nails for a long time, there's a sort of vulnerability under there that you feel. Or if you're a person that, you know, shaved their head ever in their life for the first time, that cold, you know, that, that vulnerable exposure that you feel whenever you uncover something that hasn't been uncovered for a very long time, this is what I felt on my head underneath this chunk of weight that was being lifted. And my ego came into play here immediately because without even thinking, I resisted and I felt my, my will grab onto this, this, this burden and pull it back onto my head with this sort of, no, this is mine kind of fighting. I don't even know why that happened, but that force knew why. That force knew me because immediately this mother-father figure sent me a message that was exactly the right thing to say to get me to let go. And that thing was, do not worry, uh, it will not hurt anyone else. It will dissolve into me, it will not harm anything, it will be turned into something good. And that was exactly the right thing to say, because as it turns out, for my entire life, I had, and I mean a very strong sort of principle, that when something bad comes into your life, we all tend to pass the buck. We all tend to dump it on somebody else. Somebody has a bad day uh, at work, comes home, yells at their kids. They feel better. Now the kids feel like crap. The kid's going to go to school and bully another kid. That kid might now feel better, but the other kid now feels like crap. That kid goes home, yells at his mother, tells her she's worthless. The mother felt good. Now the mother feels bad. The kid feels better. It just I had recognized a long time ago this negative burden seems to sweep around society, sweep through people, and instead of 
either diffusing it or just keeping it to themselves, people constantly dump it on others. And I had always wanted to hold on to anything that comes at me. I'm going to die with this thing. This thing is going down with the ship in the case of me. But you see, this headache, I guess, this weight on my head, in my mind, was from holding on to all of this stuff for so long. And this forest knew exactly what to tell me to get me to let go, which was, don't worry, I promise in this case you can let it go. It's not gonna go forward to anybody else. It's going to dissolve. Poof. This forest was basically saying, I'm God, I can do what I want, and I will nullify this right now. I know I'm talking about God a lot, but that's the only word you can use when you're talking about a giant consciousness that has just unimaginably more size than you. I mean, an ant would call you some kind of god, right? You may not be a god, but you at least are to that ant. So this force I was coming up against, the only word I can say is god in relation to a human. So I did, I let go, thanks to that very simple message. You can let this go, it will not hurt anyone else. I finally released, and this thing was lifted off of my forehead like a big slab of heavy wet clay, and just went up across that ceiling above me into that uh, mysterious ghostly face and just dissolved. And that's it, the burden was gone. And after all these little maintenance moments happened, um, there was sort of a stillness and a sort of, well, this is it. This is what happens this time. And I started floating down. And as I started floating down and away from this face, and I could almost feel it receding above me into a distance, I could feel communication channels closing down. I could feel that soon I wouldn't be able to hear so clearly this force and so the last thing I mentally uttered at this uh, god force as it disappeared above me was, I don't know what just happened here, but I will be back. <laughs> and that's the last thing I was able to send out as I remembered my body and I kept sinking down until finally I reached my body. My flesh closed up and I opened my eyes and I was in my room. And I couldn't believe what had just happened out of just one gram of mushrooms and giving it the space it needs to work. And of course, the rest is history, as you could say, because that guaranteed, that first experience, guaranteed that I would visit again and try to understand what I encountered in that first psychedelic experience. And in those subsequent experiences over the next couple of months, I never did quite reach that place again. I never had that clear encounter with the mother-father figure um, in that strange, infinite, glowing universe uh, as I did that first time. But just as much healing happened anyway in all sorts of different forms, um, it became for me much more nature-based. As uh, my, my experiences went on, there was always a heavy component of nature, so visions of plants and, and, and creatures of nature, small and large enlightenments about uh, the environment, about my body, about the whole system that is life. Um, very, very earth based sort of experiences. And once in a while, when I did take more mushrooms, I would sort of launch off into some distant cosmic adventures where I would be shown all kinds of solar system-like uh, visions that I am not quite sure what they meant. Sometimes, you know, you just go too far and you don't understand what you're seeing. But always there's this feeling that you're being taught. Always there's this feeling that this is important stuff. And definitely... Most certainly, um, there is healing to be found, as I've given in this example. I did go on from that first experience with much less of a physical burden. I felt definitely that many, many things had been removed from my body that had been wrong. And now, you could say these were just tensions. They were not actually illnesses, you know? I'm not saying they were illnesses. I'm not saying I had a tumor and it was removed. I'm saying that there were... Um, I guess you could call them complexes in my body 
that were causing me problems, and a lot of those were removed. Some of them took、uh, more work. Some of them took years of work of this kind of work to to actually fully clear away. But it's been an amazing tool in that journey, in that healing journey, just on its own. These psychedelic experiences have been absolutely priceless and effective. Not to mention, of course, the battle against ego, and also just understanding myself and and liberating what I really am out of the the clutches of ego. Man, have psychedelics been just a glowing godsend. So it's no no big surprise that I just may have encountered God in there because it definitely definitely has had that effect on my life.、Um, And I mean, look. One of those effects is the fact that I can comfortably say God now. A lot of people these days might see that as a negative, and you know what? Maybe I'll make an episode about that soon. But again, I have to remind you that when I say God, I don't mean a man in the sky. I don't mean any particular religion's view of God. I just mean the sense that there is consciousness to this universe. There is some kind of mind greater than ours. Out there, or right here,、um, however you slice it. I mean, everything I've experienced in life, especially in the last bunch of years, points to the the idea that there really is consciousness greater than the human mind. There is consciousness that doesn't necessarily need a body, but you know what? Even if you say this consciousness needs a body, maybe the universe is its body. Why does every body have to look like an animal? Um, a greater body than ours might be absolutely unrecognizable to us, just like a germ on your skin would have no idea that their universe, your body, has a conscious mind. That's you. But you know what? Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it for today. I think that's a lot to digest, especially for someone that has never heard of this stuff. I don't want to overload you, but as I said, that first experience for me was, in a nutshell, what I would find in all of my future psychedelic experiences,、um, in one way or another. That is the feeling of the presence of external, greater minds, be they God or some kind of who knows interdimensional. Consciousnesses. I don't pretend to know the science or the answer. I mean, you could even say it's your subconscious. But the feeling is there is some external force that is intelligent and interacting for your healing in that experience, and also, of course, healing as I've described, and also coming up against the ego. When I was fighting to hold on to a burden, that was ego. When I thought about it later, I realized, yeah, that was ego making me hold on to that thing, and that's when I really started to understand that ego keeps me sick. Ego was making me sick and keeping me sick, and even when healing came along and tried to help me, I resisted. But it wasn't me resisting. Me, I wanted to get rid of this burden, but the thing holding on was fear—fear fear that it would hurt someone else. And as we said in the beginning of this episode, ego isn't only about selfishness. Ego can cut in many ways, and one of the ways it was cutting me at the time was trying to hold on to a burden to help others, but to a point where it was destroying me. There are many, many more adventures in psychedelia that I can share, and many more mysteries. But that was the first, and that was the foundation for what kept me going, and has led me to all sorts of amazing, impossible things that I've only, only started sharing. So thank you for joining me on this adventure in psychedelia. If you are catching this on YouTube, please rate, please comment. Let me know what you think, or have you ever had an experience like this on psychedelics? Or if you have any questions about psychedelics, I'd be happy to answer as much as I can. And also subscribe, of course, to keep track on any new episodes. You get the audio and video episodes into your feed if you're on YouTube. Now, if you are listening to this on audio, of course, keep an eye on HigherIdeas.net once in a while in case、uh, some videos come out. 
Also on that website, higherideas.net, you can find any way to get in touch with me, including email, including Facebook, where I am happy to be your Facebook friend, uh, Twitter, which I don't quite know how to use properly. I'm not really getting the Twitter thing, but maybe it'll help if I have more followers. And of course, look forward to the next episode, which will have to be that video. So, fellow human, until next time, keep thinking.